What is the definition of a good doctor? So, after those uh, fellowship and everything, what's your what's the focus of your practice? Thankfully, I'm considered one of the high volume implanters now in Egypt, maybe mm -hmm. in the region. Um, uh, I'm trying to establish now a center of excellence, which I wish to do, a world class uh, center of excellence where where you could treat any kinds of cases, the most challenging case, cases that need uh, special expertise and mm -hmm. special instruments, mm -hmm. and not just treat patients, but educate at the same time. Mm. I'd love to have an academy mm -hmm. for other surgeons to learn and to propagate what you learn to others. And because this, at the end of the day, this is what makes it all worthwhile at the end. Mm. Let's say out of 100, how many people, men especially, knows about this penile implant? Well, let's thank uh, social media because the power of social media um, nowadays, everyone knows about it. And by the way, um, our Egyptian fellow uh, patients and maybe Arabic patients are very, very particular when it comes to uh, treatment of sexual dysfunction. You find the patient aware of the doctors, mm -hmm. of the techniques, mm -hmm. even of the brands of the implants. Mm. So you have to be very uh, meticulous, very careful when you uh, counsel your patient because you're dealing with a well-educated patient about mm -hmm. this problem now. Uh, I have to say we still have a long way. That's why it's still, it's still our responsibility to raise the awareness, and, uh, but it's way better than, than before. But if you would say, I'd say maybe a little bit over 50%. Wow. But there's uh, still a long way. In Egypt, uh, when you do the practice, how many men get malleable versus uh, inflatable? Well, that's a pretty good question. When you come to compare, 70% malleable versus 30% inflatable. How come? I mean, patient satisfaction rate is uh, uncomparable. Higher, it's above six, 96 compared to 91. Yeah. There's a huge difference, but uh, I think there are two main reasons for that. Uh, we have a lot of people doing the malleable, mm -hmm. a lot of surgeons that are used to doing the malleable, and maybe that gives a, a, an impression that the malleable is better. Ah. Because you, I know we're dealing with a very uh, confidential um, mm. s uh, specialty, but at the same time, there is room for word of mouth. So mm. the more malleables, mm. the more that it's spread out, that malleables ah. might be better. Ah. So that might, might be a point. And that's why we're working on raising the awareness and mm -hmm. making people aware of the benefits of the inflatable compared to the malleable. Mm. The other important reason is maybe the financial part, because no, mm. back in Egypt, the specialty of andrology is not covered by insurance. Mm. So it's all out of, po of the patient's mm. pockets. Mm. And you know, that could be a, uh, a, a reason for dictating which side you take. Uh, but aren't there patients who ask for inflatables after they had malleable? Yes, I have these kinds of patients, of course, uh, because mm. like I said, uh, they become aware of the benefits of the inflatable mm. and how natural it is and uh, how, the, how better it is than the malleable, and they come asking. Some patients sometimes even do the malleable because their uh, financial status isn't uh, ready for, at the moment, so they'll go for the malleable, and then in a few years' time, when it's, it's, they can, they come over and we switch it to an inflatable. So after they switch it to the inflatables, what's their responses? It's way better. It's way uh, better. There's a huge, huge difference, a huge mm. difference. Mm. Uh, because as, you, as we know that inflatable is more natural in, in terms of the mechanism of erection, the size, the length, the girth, the stability, and during, and the concealment, of course. Mm. Do, in Egypt, do you have a public path or it's just a... No, no, we don't have that, yeah, that, that, that gym issue. Mm. Like you want to walk around mm. being proud of yourself. Mm. No, we don't have that in Egypt, but mm. everyone wants to be proud in front of his partner. What's your definition of a best surgeon? A best surgeon is a knowledgeable surgeon. A best surgeon is who is uh, keen on his patient's welfare, honest, transparent with his patient, has the knowledge and ex experience to deal with the, uh, any kind of challenging cases especially, and to be keen on his patient even after surgery, and at the same time to be a good teacher mm. for his uh, fellow trainees and, and, and fellows and uh, residents. Mm. You are now in a prosthetics urology. Mm -hmm. I know you are doing a great job there, but in 10 years, where do you want to lead your uh, practice to? 
Well, as soon as I establish the center of excellence, I uh, strive for uh, an academy for teaching surgeons. Mm. I'd like to propagate this example or this model across the region. Mm. Let's say you were able to achieve your goal, like uh, you were able to switch it to the more inflatables, you were able to support more patient satisfactions, but what do you get throughout that process? Well, I think that's the main reason why you uh, wanted to be a doctor from the first place, is to help people, make people um, lives better. And part of it, of course, is you, need, you need to make a, a living. Mm. But imagine if you make a living out of making people happy that makes it more worthwhile. Mm. And uh, like we say back in Egypt, uh, what we believe in is that sometimes, sometimes, just a single prayer from a sincere patient could be worth millions and millions of dollars. You must have a lot of oncologists, friend, right? Yes, of course. You've seen many oncologist patients, right? So oncologist patient. Oncologists are doing a great job, make them live longer, but they seldom get a doctor thank you because it's a destructive surgery. They take something out. You need to pay something for your life. Correct. To survive longer. But there's a cost of it. Incontinence, erectile dysfunction sometimes. So patients seldom say thank you, even though, even though the surgeon did a great job. I saw many oncologist friends at the, at the beginning. They were really great guys. They're full of life. They're very, I mean, enjoyable. They're always happy, most of the cases, because they become oncologists. But after 10 years, now almost it's 10 or more years with me, they somehow became a different person. They're more pessimistic. If you go to the oncology conferences, they always fight each other. <laughs> I'm right, you are right, you are not right, I'm doing the best. No, I'm doing the best, something like that happens. But if you come to the andrology conference, like, a, like a SMSNA, like this time, have you ever seen something like that? No, we're all happy around here. Yeah, mm. generally we are all happy, right? We're all friends Chill out and happy. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that kind of personality led us to Correct. this field. Correct. But at the same time, I think patient response, how patients feedback, is the reason why we became what we are now. So do you think it affected your life other than your practice? Well, you have a point there, but it's the totally opposite in our case, I think, because like you said, oncologists take something out. Mm -hmm. You're losing something yes. to extend your lifespan. On the contrary, you're providing something that was mm -hmm. missing. For example, if, uh, if, if a couple lost their intimacy mm -hmm. because of sexual dysfunction, mm -hmm. you provide that. If mm -hmm. a couple is uh, trying hard to get a baby, mm -hmm. you help them get a baby. So mm -hmm. it's the opposite. That's mm -hmm. why they're happier. An oncologist is a different story. He's not improving lives, he's maybe uh, extending lives, uh, increasing the survival rates. So I know that hearing the word thank you might, will never be compared to the, how much we hear the word thank you, because we improve lives, we make uh, uh, people happier, we make couples happier. So that's why there's a huge difference in the uh, patient's perspective to the service you're providing. Some may think us as a cover-up guys, like a cosmetic surgery, you know. Mm -hmm. One man or woman had a traffic accident, they some, you know, scars over here. Then cosmet uh, cosmetic, you know, surgeons, they make it better somehow. I time to time think maybe prosthetic urologists, what we do is a similar jobs. So uh, I think there's a good reason why you became a prosthetic urologist after all this talk, because you want them to be happy, not just survive, right? Correct. So, Ahmed, what do you do in your uh, uh, free time, let's say, when you, when you uh, have a weekends or something like that, what do you do? I know you're pretty, very, very busy with your practice. Well, like you just said, I think you could relate to, to that, that we don't have that much of free time. <laughs> <laughs> Even back in Egypt, the lifestyle in Egypt. And uh, as a weekend, we only, uh, I myself, I only have one day as a weekend, which is, oh. is on Friday. Oh. Yeah. But um, during my free time, um, like I said, I love handcrafting, uh, so I like to fix things around the house. Fix um, things? Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a list of things that have to be fixed during the week, and oh. I wait for the weekend. I, they even call me the handy guy uh, <laughs> among our family whenever I'm visiting here or there. Ahmed, can you check out this? Mm. Can you check out that? Mm. So, yeah, I have, even have a, I invest in a good uh, toolkit mm. at home. So, do you like to cook as well? Well, cooking is, uh, is, is, is a good combination between experimenting <laughs> and handcrafting as well. Well, yeah, I'm uh, not that much, but I'm, uh, I like to grill. 
they, they like what what I what what I make at at home. But mm -hmm. um, to love or like cooking doesn't necessarily mean that you're a good cook. Mm. Do you like to drive? I like to drive, but maybe not in Egypt. <laughs> 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 but I do, yeah. When you are on someone's car, do you prefer to drive or do you pr prefer to sit? Uh, not drive. No, I prefer to drive, honestly. Mm. Yeah. No. Because you, when I'm sitting next to him, I'm mm. practically driving, but, <laughs> but in another <laughs> sense, I have no control. <laughs> so cooking, driving, handcrafting, it's all three of this has a, has a common aspect. You want to sit in the driver's seat. You, you, want, to be, you want to control things, because uh, that's actually a common thing that is required to be a surgeon. As a surgeon, we always sit in the driver's seat. When you do the surgery, right? You can't really sit back and relax. No, you, you're the number one responsible. Yeah. You are the guy who should rule the scene. And uh, you know what happens if you lost your control during the surgery. So I think it's just a, a characteristics. I interviewed other surgeons, other great surgeons before. Every time I do, I go to their house. They're always, almost always a great cook and they always love driving, not sitting in the other seat. And they, most of the case, they are very good at their handcrafting. So that's the reason why I was asking you. I wanted to see why. Why they always love to do the cooking, driving, or handcrafting. It turns out that uh, our personalities are more of a be in control rather than chill out. Why the teaching and the attending, uh, joining, Coming to the meeting like this is important to you. Why? Well, attending a meeting like this, uh, the Sexual Medicine Society of North America's meeting is one of maybe most important meeting when it comes to the field of sexual medicine. Uh, imagine a congregation of the best minds and experts in the field from all over the world. So where else would you find the best source of uh, state-of-the-art science, knowledge, and experience and uh, it's a good opportunity to exchange uh, experience with your fellow colleagues and uh, to present your work and uh, it's even sometimes uh, at the beginning of multi-institutional uh, projects that could lead to the highest quality of uh, science as a byproduct at the end and then when you speak about teaching I think that teaching is uh, is very crucial for any surgeon any physician teaching because when you teach, you have to stop, pause, analyze your steps. We as surgeons, as you once said, uh, sometimes become blind because we keep doing our surgeries day mm -hmm. after day. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you teach, you have to analyze your steps. You have to explain why you do them to your um, residents or your junior uh, surgeons. And uh, sometimes questions come up and make you think about it. At then is, is when you improve and when you change a tweak here and there. Even your trainee or uh, the person you're teaching can come up with questions and he's, he's, he's looking to your, um, to your surgeries with, with, with a different perspective, with a different thinking, with a different mind. So um, I think it's a symbiotic relationship like you mentioned before between the surgeon, between the teacher and the trainer and the trainee. And at the same time, attending s such a meeting is very important because in a, in a field like ours, uh, seeing advancements every day, you're seeing advancements by the day, whether the technologies uh, we're using, uh, the devices, uh, our implants, uh, ev even the surgical techniques. It took a lot of effort coming from Egypt to the U.S., I believe, right? Mm -hmm. You had to get a COVID test. Of course, seven, within 72 hours. <laughs> <laughs> of course, and you had to get through the vaccination. Yeah. And another and, and the vaccination, another test here to attend the meeting. And you had to go through the, that tough visa thing, right? Of course. Even so, you came over here to get trained. I salute to your enthusiasm. Thank you. <laughs>